and it is a particular pleasure um, welcoming a special guest um, to us today, um, who I know has a lot to do and a lot um, on your plate. So thank you so very much for taking the time joining us um, today. Um, it is a great pleasure um, announcing and introducing to you Dr. Sumaya Swaminata. She is the chief scientist of the WH. Oh, and why we have um, invited you to our conference, I don't, I don't think I need to explain this. Um, it has become um, a part of our everyday life to think about health, but also to think about digital health and the benefits of artificial intelligence. Um, thank you so very much for being here today. And since we have the pleasure of having a real audience also in the room, let us all give her um, a very big applause, not only for being here today, but what she's doing for us at the WTHO to make us uh, safe. So many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And how we wanted to do this today, we wanted to give you the opportunity um, to speak to us for um, maybe 15 minutes. Um, and then we would also love to ask some questions uh, to you. So the floor would be yours. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, many thanks for this, uh, this opportunity. And I think it's one of the examples of the good use of digital technology that we're able to connect like this, and it doesn't matter where in the world we are, we all can um, connect. And in fact, it's been quite, uh, that's been one of the real high points for me during the pandemic is this ability for us at WHO to be able to connect with networks of scientists and researchers and doctors from around the world from the beginning um, to really understand what's happening with this disease to get the latest information and the incredible passion uh, that scientists have shown and also their willingness to share information, share data. It's a completely different model from what it was in the past when um, academics would first wait to publish before you know talking about their research findings. But today, you know, we have data platforms like GISAID, which host uh, the genomic sequence data, um, over 5 million whole genome sequences from around the world. And that's the kind of global collaboration that has enabled us to keep track of this virus, to, to track its evolution, to track the variants. The fact that we have talking about Omicron today is only because we have this ability in real time. So it's really thanks to scientists all over the world. And this is why we feel sad when we see that countries are punished for their transparency, uh, particularly the you know South Africa and the neighboring countries have now been put on travel bans from many other countries. And uh, this is uh, a way of disincentivizing data sharing because then the next country to detect a new variant will think twice about declaring it if the reaction of the world is, is going to be to cut you off. It also impacts science because, you know, uh, supply chains uh, are all dependent on, on these transport links. And the moment those are snapped, you also have an impact on what can be done in laboratories. So, so I just wanted to make that uh, statement because I think I want to start with talking about equity. Equity is is I think at the center of everything we see today, including digital health, digital technologies and artificial intelligence. If we do not think about equity from the beginning, we are going to go wrong. And we can have the best algorithms and the best technologies and the best of intentions, but we will not be serving people uh, if, if we don't include uh, 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 equity. So, in fact, I want to start with that because we started thinking about this in 2019 when the science division was set up and I was appointed as the first chief scientist at WHO. What are those cutting edge technologies that we need to be leveraging for public health and clinical medicine? And what should WHO be doing? And as you know, WHO is a normative agency. We do standards and guidelines and, and, and many countries depend on us um, and our guidelines. So we said, let's take two examples 
one was artificial intelligence uh, for health and the other was genome editing again a technology with immense potential for curing genetic diseases but we had just heard about experiments by chinese uh, researcher to you know have used genome editing to actually edit the genomes of embryos that were then uh, born as as babies in fact those twins today are growing up um and and there were huge ethical concerns around that so we took these two topics and we said let's put together a multidisciplinary group of uh, experts who um, include not only the people who understand the technology and the science but also people who uh, are from background of ethics of law of social sciences philosophy and so on and we came up with a framework for the ethics and governance around artificial intelligence in health and some of the principles that the group came out with were around equity and the digital divide and you know will will the movement into digital technologies further exclude some people and further exacerbate the health inequities second is around data protection you know how do you protect the, uh, i mean everyone is talking about this and and what we believe is that people are willing to share their health data for the better good for the public good if you can explain to people that their data is going to be used for a particular purpose and that it's not going to be used for let's say commercial uh, gains or or you know won't be used for things beyond uh, uh, certain analytics which are useful for public policy the third uh, thing to think about when you think about ai based uh, diagnostics or ai based treatment decisions is a liability who is liable if the algorithm makes a mistake is it the developers of the mm -hmm. algorithm is it hospitals is it clinicians how will these tools potentially alter the relationship between providers and patients because traditionally the doctor makes the decisions and takes responsibility for them but here you're you're you know allowing an algorithm to do it and how do you regulate the private sector in this area which includes several of the world's largest technology companies and um this committee concluded that ethically optimized tools and applications could sustain the widespread use of ai to improve human health and quality of life while mitigating or eliminating many risks and uh, worse practices and uh, one of the good examples where ai could actually help uh, in public health is in tb which is uh, tuberculosis is one of the uh, infectious diseases that actually kills uh, one and a half million people a year it's the, it's the top infectious disease killer it's uh, getting worse because of the pandemic and artificial intelligence algorithms reading x-rays of people can actually differentiate there are many companies now that have developed algorithms which are quite sensitive and specific and potentially you could probably diagnose also cancer and other things so and covid it was used also to to diagnose covid pneumonia um and, and so it could be used in many areas of the world where you don't have radiologists this could potentially really be very useful to increase the diagnosis of uh, tb and similarly we are looking at another application on cervical cancer cervical cancer is one of the biggest killers uh, the fourth leading cause of death due to cancer and the the deaths due to cervical cancer are disproportionately higher in the low middle income countries because of late diagnosis and late access to treatment so if you could diagnose these lesions early they can usually be cured uh, and they can be cured quite easily by doing uh, some kind of a thermoablation or cryo based uh, local treatment so using an ai algorithm on a phone a nurse or a community health worker should be able to take pictures of the lesion in the woman's cervix and the algorithm reads it and gives her an opinion and then the woman can straight to be be sent for further investigations and treatment so so these are just a couple of examples where you can have these ai uh, algorithms have huge impacts on public health apart from all of the other applications that have been in high income countries you know for cancer treatment for radiotherapy also for personalized medicine and so on Uh, of course uh, it also plays a role and has played a role during the pandemic in detecting outbreaks you know we we uh, you can have algorithms that are screening um all of the news that's happening around the world and the social media and so on in fact we use that in a system um, 
uh, that our emergencies program uh, uses to, to scan and pick up signals which need further investigation. So you pick up like four or 5,000 signals. And out of that, of course, you know that, you know, there are a couple of hundred that are worth further look. And then you come up with a couple that need to be investigated, but it helps to do that. And, uh, and of course, it's also helped uh, in predicting uh, in in, uh, in in modeling and in predicting mobility of people uh, and and so on. So the um, use of these technologies obviously has to be done thoughtfully, and therefore um, you need people who have the expertise not just in developing the code, but obviously in understanding the. The landscape, the epidemiology, the amount, the kind of data that's available, and again, we we all know that biases in algorithms are uh, very very common, and you need a very thoughtful approach to avoid those biases from uh, really becoming a limiting uh, factor. So, our uh, Department of Digital Health and Innovation, that was created as part of uh, the Science Division set about developing a global strategy for digital health. This was endorsed by all of our 194 member states last year. We know that different countries are at different stages of digital development and we, we're coming up with some kind of ranking of the maturity level. But the main thing is that countries need to think very holistically about what kind of backbone they want to build for their health system. Because in the future, we're uh, really not going to talk about digital health so much as digitally transformed health systems. So we have to keep in mind that the ultimate goal is to provide better health care. And I remember that uh, during, again, the peak of the Delta wave, uh, which affected India and many countries in South Asia uh, over the summer months, that there, were, uh, there was a call from uh, doctors in, in uh, small towns, um, which uh, they had to suddenly handle a number of patients who had severe respiratory illnesses, and they did not have the experience. They were not specialists and they suddenly they had to use all sorts of new oxygen devices and things that the government was providing to them, but they had no experience. So we used platforms like the ECHO platform, which is one way of democratizing knowledge. You had uh, experts sitting in the US or Canada or wherever in the world or in one part of India or Nepal teaching uh, in, in a very uh, sort of inclusive and uh, in, in a dialogue going through once a week cases of a severe COVID and how to manage. And I sat through many of those sessions. So I could really see the benefit of having platforms like that. So not just as a one way delivery of knowledge, but really in a way to engage and, and be able to think as a group and come up with solutions uh, as a group. So this is often not uh, used, I think adequately, these platforms are not used for the purposes of training and, and mentoring uh, healthcare workers who may be further removed from the cities and who don't have the latest uh, uh, information. Of course, you know, because we're in, in, in the pandemic, um, uh, the DG, Dr. Tedros, along with uh, Chancellor Merkel announced a couple of months ago, the creation of the WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin. This is a new center that's designed to foster greater sharing of data and information between countries and to improve global surveillance for epidemics and uh, pandem pandemics, again, by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other cutting edge technologies. And the idea is to have better data, uh, better analytics, and better decision making at the country level, because ultimately these things have to have an impact on the ground. So a global hub that does not have an impact on the ground is, is really not the, uh, what we aim for. And because you strengthen countries' uh, abilities to use data wisely and decision-making that can all feed them into a global um, hub. And it's, it's uh, wonderful that our member states yesterday at the Special World Health Assembly have agreed to debate and discuss uh, a treaty or an agreement, which will be called a pandemic uh, instrument of some kind or the other, where there will be rules, regulations, and guardrails laid out about what the world should do when faced with a pandemic in terms of having a coordinated and comprehensive uh, response, both in terms of the, you know, the kind of uh, restrictions that are put in place, uh, travel, trade, et cetera, 
but also about how to develop the tools that you need and how to share them uh, equitably. So over the next couple of years, I think countries will be investing more and more in preparedness, hopefully. A lot of the preparedness will mean using digital tools, putting these tools in the hands of people in the community and at the lowest levels of the health center, at the primary health care level, expanding surveillance, One Health, not just human, but also animal and environment, because we know that new pathogens most likely will come from the animal kingdom and then jump into humans. That's what all the previous uh, zoonotic uh, diseases have been from Ebola to, to Zika to, you know, to SARS and MERS and, and now the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so zoonotic infections are uh, going to increase. And so we need to, to have that kind of a surveillance, which is across all the three uh, environment, human and animal. And, um, and then I think transparency is, is the other thing about how countries are going to use these tools, what, how is the data going to be collected? How is it going to be used? How can individuals actually have control of their own health data so that they also learn uh, to, to um, uh, that's one way of making people more health literate and taking more responsibility for their uh, own health. So perhaps um, I can stop there and, uh, and turn it back to you for, uh, for any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Sumia. Um, and I'm so, so glad that you started out with the issue of equity, um, because this is something which has been like um, a theme throughout many, many of the panels uh, we had. Um, yesterday, um, Rebecca Greenspan told us um, that some countries were put two decades um, back in their development efforts. Um, today, we talked to Gabriela Ramos um, and heard that there is not just a huge digital gap between countries, but still also within countries. Um, what I wanted to ask you first is, um, since we do have that huge digital gap, um, is the international community doing enough to really utilize new technologies in all countries to help us prevent pandemics, prepare for pandemics, and answer to pandemics? I, I think clearly we have to do more. And, you know, all different sectors have to think about what they can do actually to make this. You talked about the digital divide. And one of the things that I've seen in some of my travels uh, in Asia and in Africa is the fact that even now we, we don't have connectivity in many parts of the world. And in fact, it's estimated that half the world doesn't have access to the internet, though, you know, many more do have access to mobile phones, but, uh, but they don't have access to internet. <laughs> that was very fitting, I have to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said phone and my phone rang. Um, so I have been in villages where children have had no access to online education, whereas their counterparts in cities obviously could at least do that, even though they didn't have in-person learning. So I think the, the companies and governments have to make sure that they provide connectivity to all of their citizens, particularly not leaving behind those in remote areas, not just focusing on the cities. So I think that's the first thing. The second is also around uh, thinking about those people who will have more difficulty. So we have to look at the gender aspect. Generally, women have less access to the internet than men do in most countries. Older people, disabled people, they may not be able to use the way that younger people are able to. So we need to think about how to assist them. And this is true also of high income countries where a lot of services are being provided now through the tele mode and uh, older individuals are really not that comfortable with having virtual consultations. Uh, and there are some things that you need to see a doctor for in person. And then uh, thirdly, I think we need more research uh, more monitoring and evaluation. We're rolling out many things, digital thinking that it's all good, but I think we have to measure the outcomes and uh, not all digital innovation necessarily is improving. Some of them actually add burden on healthcare providers without improving the uh, outcomes. So I think it's important, just like we assess new vaccines and drugs through clinical trials, we need to also be doing 
studies, uh, research studies to document the impact on, on people and, and whether they're actually uh, benefiting from it. So this needs carefully done studies and governments, I think, should collaborate with, uh, with academics uh, and with companies as, as they're rolling out these, these new initiatives so that you're constantly learning and uh, updating your policies. Um, one of the other things you mentioned was trust. Um, it was also liability, um, the quality of data. Um, and you also mentioned um, data privacy and what we do with the data. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're discussing in the uh, WHO the issue of where to get the data, how the quality of the data, how to use the data, and where to find the line between data privacy and the right to protect your own data and the, so to say, necessity to protect uh, society? Yeah, I think this is a very important topic. It's fairly complex, but basically if we, take, if we approach it very simply, we have, we're looking at say three or four types of data. The first one is public health data that governments collect and they provide to WHO. So that's at the very aggregate level that we see uh, data. The second is, uh, and, and that kind of data I think can be shared, it should be shared uh, openly. Uh, it doesn't, uh, because it's aggregated, so it's, it's not about individuals, but it's about the whole country or the state or the region. Then we have data that comes from research, and I think this is where we can actually make a lot of progress. We need to be able to share that data uh, quickly, more openly, transparently. There has been a lot of moves in the past. WHO was also at the center of leading a movement where research funders actually put into their grant proposals a clause whereby researchers must make their data wide, you know, publicly available within a certain time frame after completing the study, particularly clinical trials, because otherwise you get biases. People don't publish negative studies. You get only the good results being published. You never know about all the trials that did not show a good impact. So, so that has to be enforced and, and also more rapid sharing like people have done in COVID. And I think that can happen provided there are some principles around data use. And I say this because of the experience with the whole genome sequences that people have so willingly shared for COVID and why they didn't share for other pathogens in the past was because researchers from the developing countries felt that if they shared all of this data, that they would lose their, uh, their right mm. to or, or, or the ability to be able to publish it, to write about it, because someone else, it becomes public knowledge and then anyone in the world can use it. So that, so that fear needs to be, uh, or the disadvantage really needs to be uh, addressed by having some principles that academics, researchers agree to the way they use data and the credit that needs to be given to people who generate the data. And the third set of data is a patient level data, individual data, which is where the data privacy and confidentiality issues come. And we need to build in mechanisms. Uh, there are ways of anonymizing data uh, and, and there are other ways also by building trust. There are countries where citizens have volunteered to share their health data with the government, individual data, because they believe the governments are going to use it for the benefit of the public as a whole and that they're not going to use it for any other purpose which might disadvantage them. So there you have to start with building trust. And um, even though you know there are many ways of anonymizing data, I understand that if you really want to, you can still go and find the identity of people. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to, on all of these three areas, WHO is working with countries, firstly, to strengthen data collection systems on the ground, because still we have many countries with very poor data collection and surveillance systems. Even basic things like births and deaths are not being properly counted and, uh, uh, and monitored. And then we have, um, um, so strengthen it on the ground, but then talk about how, they, how to share and how to use that data uh, so that it's beneficial for all. And you know, I always think about CERN and, and how, but then that's data, that's physics. That's not data to do with human beings. So in a way it's easier, but the concept there is thousands of researchers around the world actually working on a common data set. If you could do that for health data, and we have an experiment, uh, a group called IDARE, 
which has recently been set up essentially to look at research and artificial intelligence around health data. So I think there are some small steps being taken and I hope that it will become a movement in the future. Thank you so very much um, for explaining those three different um, or in, in, in clearly different shades between those three different um, fields. There's the first question from our audience coming in um, digitally, um, picking up on one of the um, dilemmas, so to say, um, which you also um, touched upon um, in your opening remarks, and that is the dilemma of we need transparency to fight the pandemic and we need the numbers at the same time, then there will be as an answer, severe travel restrictions. Um, what, <laughs> where is the balance? Um, how can we ensure that there is an incentive to, to, to share the data without having to be afraid to be severely punished, so to say, for being transparent? Yeah, I, I think it's it's quite easy and it really uh, boils down to countries agreeing on certain uh, responses, you know, for a pandemic which affects the whole world, you do need a global set of rules that everybody will play by. Unfortunately, the world doesn't have that. We don't have a set of rules and so every country responds the way they feel. Of course, every country does it in the, you know, to protect their own citizens. So. Uh, you know, that's that's what they, they are supposed to do, but sometimes they end up doing unscientific things, uh, which doesn't help anyone. And on the other hand, it hurts a lot of people. It hurts lives and livelihoods. And so I think at least now from this experience that we've had we, for the future, we should have a system where the only way to encourage open sharing of data and information is to make sure that firstly, you're not punished. And secondly, that the rewards, the benefits are also shared equitably. Mm -hmm. So if everybody's sharing their data and then vaccines are being developed based on those genome sequences, then those vaccines must be shared with people around the world, wherever they're needed. So that, that's a, 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 right now it's a, it's a dream and an ambition. We need to get there, we're not there. Thank you so much. I'm looking at our audience here in the room. Um, this is also your opportunity. We have another five minutes um, to ask questions. And if not, I'm going to pick up another one of the digital questions. Oh, yes, please. The, the mic is coming. Just one second. <laughs> Uh, artificial intelligence and what artificial, shall I start again? Yes, please. So, yes, I didn't hear the Okay, uh, so my name's Charles Litchfield. Uh, I'm interested in what you said about bias in artificial intelligence. Uh, what you've seen, the sort of biases you've noticed when you've tried to um, use artificial intelligence in your work, what's been obviously wrong, what mitigating um, procedures you've managed to put in place. Thank you. So um, we, we haven't used, uh, used it for too many applications, but one thing I'd mentioned was the cervical cancer study. And we started off with, um, you know, you need images to train the algorithm on. And so one of our sources was uh, the, the National Cancer Institute in the US that's got a big collection of images, but it was, clear that you know, you, you're dealing with a certain demographic. And so we decided that before that algorithm could be considered to be uh, efficient enough at picking up cervical cancer lesions, it would have to be tested in at least five countries around the world, a couple of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, because we do not know if uh, cervical cancer lesions look exactly the same. So, so it, I think if you, because they can be genetic, they can be other infections, there can be, uh, you know, also things like the, the pigmentation of your skin, et cetera, which can have an impact. And so I think this is probably true that if you train an algorithm on a set, on, on a people who come from a particular background, either racial, ethnic, age, sex, et cetera, 
then you may not be able to generalize it to everybody. I think that's quite a well accepted uh, principle and needs to be thought about right from the beginning, I think, when one is developing a, a solution. Similarly, I came across another example where uh, I think a, a, by a company um, in a European country was developing an algorithm for, uh, for doc doctors to, to uh, have a decision support tool. So if somebody comes to you with fever and headache of three days or four days, what's the differential diagnosis that you would think of? Now, this would be very different in Germany and in Nigeria and in India, because the first set of diseases you would think of for fever and uh, headache would be very different in these three settings, right? So if you had an algorithm that's trained on German um, health record data, that is not going to work in Nigeria or in India. Mm. And so one really has to think about what is the application and, and then what data set would you need? And this is again an area I think where global collaboration is important. That's why these large data sets are going to be critical to inform and help developers actually train their algorithms on, uh, on a properly representative data set. Thank you so very much. Um, we are coming, unfortunately, already to, to an end of this very interesting discussion, because I mean, listening to your cell phone going off every five minutes, we know that you have a lot on your plate. Um, let me end with one of the questions which uh, came up here from our digital audience, not specifically on AI, but um, on crisis preparedness. And one of our participants is asking um, if the WHO is doing crisis preparedness scenarios where all countries come together to play through different crises to be better prepared um, for future crises. Yes, in fact, that's been happening for the last couple of years, you know, just like the, the war games that the army plays there has been this kind of scenario uh, being played out. In fact, uh, I think even at the G20 meeting in 2018, perhaps uh, this was done for the G20 leaders. So yes, it's a good way actually to look at it, but clearly it wasn't uh, enough uh, because ultimately countries were not investing enough in preparedness, in surveillance, in health systems. And we always say that health security and preparedness for pandemics has to go hand in hand with investing in universal health coverage. It's not one or the other, they're two sides of the same coin. And so it's really important, even for the high income countries, you know, that they, they were all found lacking in, in public health capacity. So they had very good tertiary care, could take care of very ill patients in the hospitals. But when it came to work in the community, it was, it was found to be, there were big gaps. So I think every country now recognizes where those gaps are and really needs to start investing both in workforce, not just in infrastructure and putting up more buildings, but really in training people. And I think it's an opportunity for young people as well, um, huge opportunities. So I think digital, digitally empowered young people can really play an important role in the future to link between communities and, and the health system. Thank you so very, very much um, for your time, for your insight, for your knowledge, for your experience. It has been a really great pleasure having you. Um, a big round of applause to you and thank you so much.